All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. I um, want to welcome those who uh, are joining us from home online and a um, uh, smaller crowd here, but I'm so glad that you're here and we're going to have a great study tonight, great time of prayer and discussion as well. We'll be back in Psalm 85 and we're going to look at revival and some evidences or marks of revival tonight. So... Um, <laughs> well, Psalm 85 is where we'll be. Let's go ahead and open our time together in prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening to regroup and to look at your word and to pray and to encourage each other. And we pray for your blessings over our time together that your word, which is already alive, would just be illuminated in our hearts, that you would renew your people and that you would call us to revival. And show us what that looks like, Lord. And help us to be wise with the time and faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we um, uh, just a few announcements to mention. Uh, I sent out earlier in the week um, our hymn of the month, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and our confession we're reading through the 1689. This Sunday we'll partake of the Lord's Supper together. We'll have our members meeting in the evening, and then we'll have our perspective New members class uh, starting at lunch on Sunday, September 13th. And then also, if any of you guys brought items up here for the Lens family, please be sure and look through those and grab them. If not, we will um, be finding a home for those somewhere. Also, we're going to look at revival tonight. So I want to recommend a couple books. This is um, a larger work, but is very captivating. It's the story of the Great Awakening, George Woodfield. So I'm going to be sharing from this tonight. It's from Banner of Truth, Arnold Dalimore. One of the most captivating things I've ever read in my life outside of Scripture, but retelling the story of George Woodfield and the awakening among God's people. And then also I wanted to recommend something I'm going to be using tonight as well. Ian Murray wrote a book called Revival and Revivalism. We're going to talk tonight about the difference between true and false revival, true and genuine awakening, and, um, and, and then what maybe is illusion of revival, but a lot of superficial measures taken, just a lot of hype and excitement. So I highly recommend Revival and Revivalism to you by Ian Murray. I want to share just a few parts of this book to set the scene for what we're going to be doing tonight. He goes back and he shares in the 1800s how there seemed to be a stirring for revival, but there was also a lot of funny business, a lot of circus tricks. Um, so there was a, a mixture of a true and genuine work of God with also um, that which was just conjured up by men. And Murray says, people had acquired a craving for effect, a craving for effect, and a desire for speedy results. Do we have that today? A craving for effect, a, a desire for speedy uh, results to want to manufacture something that only God can do, which made everything else subordinate to that end. The gospel is not attractive enough for people nowadays. This goes back in the 1800s. You would think it was written yesterday. The gospel is not attractive enough for people nowadays. Ministers must bait their trap with something else. The old-fashioned topics are seldom heard. It reads like yesterday head, headlines. The gospel, God's word, the truth of God is not enough. We've got to give them some cool prizes and toys and then give them the gospel. And you can't win carnal men to Christ by carnal means. Also, he goes and points out the evidences of revival and awakening, which are true. And we're going to look at these tonight. He says, hunger for the word of God, for prayer and for serious Christian literature. He said, a evidence of revival is a sense of wonder and profound seriousness. And he says, joyful praise and readiness to witness. A new energy in practical Christian service. A recovery of family worship and family religion, which is the day that we live in partly today. And then an observable rise of the whole moral tone of society. And these are some of the exact metrics that we're going to look at tonight to measure uh, evidences to see true and genuine revival. But he goes on like uh, any faithful Christian, and he quotes Charles Spurgeon. 
And he points back to Spurgeon saying of revival. He said, things are allowed to be said and done at revivals when nobody could defend. Do you notice at the present time the way the gospel is put? I am uttering no criticism upon anyone in particular, but I continually read the ex exhortation, give your heart to Christ, which is a phrase invented during periods of revival and we just use commonly today. Nowhere in, really in Scripture. If for a moment, Spurgeon said, our improvements seem to produce a larger result than the old gospel, it will be the growth of mushrooms. It may even be of toadstools, but it is not growth of trees of the Lord. If you want to grow oaks and trees of the Lord who are rooted deep in the soil of the earth and stable, you've got to use the means that God's given us and not worldly carnal means that are often used uh, in many churches today to sort of entertain and attract people to come to what in essence doesn't really amount to God. And then finally, I wanted to mention Ian Murray, Revival and Revivalism. He said, once methods to induce and multiply public response to the gospel are introduced, it becomes very much harder to distinguish between the genuine and the merely temporary. If the apparatus for decisions is established and the immediate public visibility of professed converts is encouraged, then the sheer weight of, quote, numbers responding comes to be taken as indisputable proof. This is exactly what we have seen in our day. I am grateful to God for Billy Graham. Um, can you find a man of greater integrity, of greater courage, who has proclaimed the gospel? But with like many movements, uh, Billy Graham himself would um, acknowledge there have, as much as we celebrate, there have been things to mourn as well. And one of the things to mourn through the revivals of Billy Graham has been the idea of the invention of the altar call, which is normal in most churches today. There's a literal altar call at the end of the service. Now that altar call is not necessarily bad. I think it can be used in a good and healthy way. There are churches that do that. So I'm not saying the practice in and of itself is necessarily wrong, but the church never used that metric for 2,000 years. It's extremely new. What the church has always done is they just preach the gospel and then God converted people. But what began to happen through that, and Billy Graham never intended this, of course, and the Lord used it in many good ways, is people begin to equate salvation with walking an aisle and saying a prayer. And that actually started in supposedly the second great awakening, which the Lord was really at work in many ways, but in many other ways it was just a circus trick produced by bad doctrine through men like Charles Finney. Um, but anyway, Billy Graham began to really institute that. And the problem then with the altar call, which is now common practice in many churches, is uh, like I said, people will come forward and all of a sudden everyone assumes that they're going to heaven when they die. And the person who comes forward will think that there's something magically inherent in walking an aisle and praying a prayer. We know this is true. And so I was a part of a Billy Graham crusade, actually. The last one that he did in New York City. And you watch these things on TV. And again, the Lord is definitely at work calling people to faith and repentance. I'm convinced of that. But it's not what you think. <laughs> um, when you actually go to a crusade in person... A, First problem is Bill Clinton was on the stage along with Catholic priests and other people. That was a problem. But the gospel did go forth. Um, but uh, what happens in those crusades is the vast majority of people going forward at the very beginning are not actually going for salvation. They're counselors who have already been trained to go forward and receive people who go forward. And so then what that does is people see that, whether or not this is in the intention, and then they think, wow, there's energy, there's momentum, the Spirit's at work, people are going forward, they're getting saved, and then maybe I should go forward too. And so it's this, well, my experience personally with it is I went down to share the gospel with, um, I don't know, five, 10, I tried to share the gospel with 12 or 15 people down front at the, at the, the front of the um, stage, as it were, where we were. And everyone I talked to, they said, we're not really interested in that. This is just what you do at a Billy Graham crusade, right? This is just what you do. So a lot of that is also going on. And it can give a false impression. And so we then have to distinguish between what is true and false revival. What is true awakening?
Some will make a distinguishment between the words revival, awakening, and so forth. Um, I'm going to use those somewhat interchangeably, although you could point to a distinction between those words. But I want us to look tonight at what true revival is. Let's begin by reading in our Bibles from Psalm 85. How can you discern a true work of God, which is what we need widespread today? God opening hearts to the gospel, people having a biblical worldview. In Psalm 85, as we studied on Sunday, we read to the choir master a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath and turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not, what? Revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. Let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. How do you know when, through the context of revival, there's just kind of tricks to coax men into getting out of their seat and walking an aisle. There's a lot of excitement and hype versus a real work of God. Verse 10, look at these characteristics. Steadfast love and mercy meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. The Bible would argue that the evidence of revival is not a large mass of people who are coming forward and responding to something in front of a pulpit. It's the demonstration of love and righteousness and a hunger and a desire for God, for the Lord. So let's look at evidences. I want you to look in your handout. I put them there of true revival from both a biblical standpoint and a historical standpoint. As I mentioned earlier, in the 1800s, a man named Charles Finney came on the scene. Uh, Charles Finney was committed to an Arminian doctrine uh, view of God. He hated the doctrines of grace. He despised the sovereignty of God. And he believed that it was his job to try to coax men in every way that he could through scheming, through tricks, to try to make a decision for Jesus. So it was an Arminian attempt to dethrone the sovereignty of God, to entertain people into superficial decisions, which is still a leftover in our own day. Um, he defunded the ordinary means of grace, which means we no longer trust in the preaching of God's Word, the administration of the ordinances and prayer. We've got to do a lot of extra things. He undermined the local church. He took ministry outside the local church into these large uh, revivals um, outside. And he promoted a sort of showmanship in these big tent revivals, which were really dominated by arm-twisting altar calls, as I mentioned. Somewhat, as I mentioned Sunday, where the preacher will sing just as I am 47 times, and then finally someone will come forward just so the preacher will shut up and everyone can go home, right? Or maybe just caught up in the emotionalism of it without the real thing. So let's look at eight marks, eight evidences of true revival that we need to pray for again today that have always accompanied a true work of God from Genesis to Revelation and through church history, from the Reformation of the 1600s to the great awakening of the 1700s, um, and then remnants even since. Number one is a recovery of Scripture and the gospel. You know that you have a true and genuine work of God, an awakening of souls from death to life, when there is a return to the Bible and there is a prizing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Arnold Dallimore... And the book I mentioned earlier on George Whitfield um, states 
that Whitfield, as God was doing a deep work in his soul, before there were any outward evidences of people being really converted in mass numbers, Whitfield would rise early in the morning. He would get on his knees and he would spread in front of him in his private prayer closet before the Lord three things. An English Bible. He had uh, Matthew Henry's commentary and then the Greek New Testament. And they said that he would read through each line of the Bible in Greek and English using Matthew Henry's commentary and on his knees every verse of every book intended to prayerfully read and study it. Friends, that is a recovery for the love of Holy Scripture, a desire for the gospel. This is what we see in Scripture. Um, it says that he prayed over every line and word of every passage until it, quote, became part of his soul. I want you to note in your Bible, 2 Kings 22 and 23. This is what we need to do, we need today. We see the young king is restoring the temple of God as it had been ignored and left um, in ruins. And Josiah has men committed to go do some work. And as they're working around the temple of God, the house of God, what they find is a book. And they bring the book to the king and they begin to read it. And what they found, get the irony of this, is that the literal word of God had been lost and buried in the house of God. In the house of God. And so they begin to read the law to the king, and immediately he began to show his contrition by ripping his clothes and by repenting and calling the nation to repentance and to reform and to live according to God's law. Do we live in a day-to-day -to, -day to where the Word of God has gotten lost among the very people and house of God? Everything is preached but the Bible in the modern pulpit. It may be alluded to, but... Walk through expositionally is something that needs to be recovered. In Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra is raised up. And he reads and he explains God's word before the people after the exile. They put him up on a platform and for hours he reads the law. And then they break him up in groups and people are appointed to begin to explain what then was read. And revival breaks out as the people respond by confessing their sin, by worshiping, and God breathes life into dead souls. This is what we see in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit took over the church, Pentecost hit. And what was the early church committed to daily? God's Word. They were committed to proclaiming the gospel. So the first evidence of true revival is recovery of Scripture in the gospel. Friends, let's talk a bit candid about this today across our country. And I don't mean, uh, you know, um, necessarily our church or any church in particular, but the church at large across our country is basically Bible illiterate. I don't think we're so much gospel hardened as we are just gospel illiterate. I've heard seminary presidents speak over the last couple of years about one of the biggest problems with incoming students who are training to be pastors in seminary is that they don't know their Bibles at all. They don't even know a lot of the basic stories. And so it's so easy to lose people in the average church today because they don't know anything about the Bible. They've not read it. They've not heard it. Friends, we need, this is high time for a recovery to hold high the Bible, to love the Bible, to be a church of one book, the Bible. And it's inerrancy and it's authority and it's sufficiency. And today what we see a lot of times is as conservative evangelicals will scream all day long that the Bible is authoritative, that it's inspired, that God wrote it through men, while all the while it sits dusty on our shelves and unopened. And while all the while we'll turn to man's wisdom to deal with the problems of our day. I think that we need a recovery not only of the authority of Scripture, but of the sufficiency of Scripture. Do you really think that the Bible is sufficient for all the problems that we encounter in our life and godliness today? We need a recovery of Scripture to say it's sufficient to order our church, our homes, our lives, even our government. Number two is a restoration of prayer. When you see real revival break out, you see the people hungry to go after God. 
you see a desire for prayer. Some of the greatest passages in Scripture have been when God's people cry out in prayer. Here's a few to note. Ezra chapter 9, verses 5 through 15, is a prayer where Ezra cries out to God on behalf of his people. He confesses the lawlessness of the people, and he shows his absolute desperation for the presence of God. Another is Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3 through 11. As the people have returned to the land, but the walls around the temple are decimated, Nehemiah then calls on behalf of God, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, and he confesses sin he appeals to God's mercy. He says, God, remember your greatness and show it to us here again. Again. Um, I mentioned Acts 2 earlier. The church, the early church was given regularly to what? To prayer. When they were meeting, they weren't making it up as they go. God's word went forth. They were praying together and they enjoyed fellowship in the Holy Spirit. That's what we'll do tonight. We'll gather around God's word, we'll pray together, we'll discuss it, and then we'll encourage one another in the faith. That's the means of growing in the grace of God. You see other periods of revival throughout the Bible. Do you remember Gideon? And the story of Gideon, his back was against the wall. He was at impossible odds against a foreign enemy that was surely to destroy God's people and he cries out and God intervenes in the most miraculous way. What about Hezekiah? Go back and read 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 19. Assyria threatens to invade God's people and to take them over and destroy them. And Hezekiah goes and lays before the Lord. And the prophets say, no, he doesn't. No, he won't. And God rescues them and shows His glory in response to Hezekiah's desperate prayer to God. We've mentioned before on a Wednesday night not long ago, leaving Scripture just to the, the pages of church history. Charles Spurgeon lived in a time when he preached and there was great revival. And Charles Spurgeon was once asked what the secret to his success was. How does this man preach... And all of a sudden, people all over are getting saved and responding. As a side note, Charles Spurgeon was an absolutely brilliant man. He was committed to family worship. He was committed to reform in the community, started orphanages, started uh, a book ministry, everything you can think of. And he would actually prepare his sermons on Saturday evening. <laughs> not many people do that. And not many people are Charles Spurgeon either. Sometimes people will say, well, Spurgeon, to which I'm quick to respond, and yeah, and I'm not Spurgeon or Calvin or any of the others. But when he was asked what the secret to the success of his sermons were, I mean, people couldn't get enough of it. He took a man down into one particular room in their sanctuary, and as he looked through the window into the doors, he noticed a massive group of people on their faces pleading before God to move and work through the preaching of His Word. And he said, that's the secret to the success of my preaching. So a recovery of Scripture and the Gospel, a restoration, a return to prayer. Number three, a third evidence of revival is repentance from sin. Repentance from sin, which is what I think the Lord is doing in our nation today, and I think what is, is what we need in our nation today, starting with the church. The 18th century evangelist, again, George Whitfield, he repeatedly preached thousands of sermons on John chapter 3. He would call for men to be born again. He would preach regeneration. You need the new birth. You need a heart transplant. You need to go from death to life. And on one particular time, it's reported that a man went to hear George Whitfield preach and he had pockets full of rocks. And he said that the only reason that he went to hear George Whitfield preach is that he was going to take the rocks out at the end of his sermon and stone him with every stone in his pocket. Listen, sometimes you wonder, how does he preach up there on Sunday? I mean, we have kids hollering. We have things going on all over the place. You don't know distractions. You haven't read George Whitfield. This man preached in a day 
where they did everything they could to get him st to stop preaching. On one particular instance, Arnold Dallimore, this is why I got to read this stuff. George Whitfield was preaching and he had some adversaries who bought the block down the road and they began to build platforms so that they could stand up on it and distract him. And they began to shout curses and insults and this joker preached on. So they got an army of men that they paid and they put cymbals and drums in their hands and they ran them right down the aisle of the, the uh, that he was preaching on, and he just kind of paused. They went through, and then he picked right back up where he started. They began to give people in the front row rotten tomatoes and apples and potatoes and fruit, even dead cats, and they would throw it at Whitfield while he was preaching. Listen, if you sat on the front row during the Great Awakening and George Whitfield was preaching, it was a dangerous seat in the house. It got so bad on this particular instant where they had tried every measure. One particular man climbed a pole, got as high up as um, as many as 30, 40, some cases 60,000 people who are gathered to hear him preach. And this particular man stripped down butt naked and began to act crazy. And finally Whitfield said, that did it. That did it. We were all gone by that point. Listen, the enemy will try anything anything. And even in the midst of that, there was a repentance of sin that the enemy couldn't distract. So as I started a few minutes ago, this one particular man stuffed his pockets with rocks and he came to attack Whitfield at the end of the sermon. He listened to the gospel go forth. He listened to the life-giving love of Christ and the truth of God's wrath against sin and God's provision in Jesus. And he came up to Whitfield at the end of his sermon and one by one he took rocks out out of his pockets until he emptied the last one and his pockets were empty and he looked at Whitfield and he said this quote I came to hear you with my pockets full of stones to break your head but your sermon got the better of me and broke my heart and he began to weep over his need for Christ and over his sin and there was a a reform in the hearts of the people. We see this throughout the Bible from Jonah who preached to the notoriously wicked Ninevites. And he said, who knows, they may repent. And secretly, they were such a hated enemy that he hoped that they wouldn't. And God showed mercy, and they did. <laughs> and they repented at the worst of odds. Time doesn't afford us to tell of the stories of King Asa, King Jehoshaphat, uh, King Joash, and Josiah, and Uzziah, and Hezekiah, again and again. God's people preach God's Word. God honors it. They respond in repentance, and then what the kings do over and over is they take a tour throughout the entire country, and every token of treason against the Most High God, every idol... Everything that was used to honor false and pagan gods, they would grind it to powder till there was nothing left. In some cases, they would make the false preachers and teachers then eat that powder. They would destroy the high places that were set aside for pagan worship, and they would call the whole nation to repent. It was serious. And they would return to holy living. So there's a return to a desire for holiness. Number five, fifth evidence of true and genuine revival is a renewal of joy. A renewal of joy. So I'm preparing us to walk through Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 where Jesus literally walks among the churches. Friends, can you imagine if Jesus Christ himself were to walk among our church this evening, this Sunday as we gather and he had a spiritual x-ray straight to our hearts. And he gave a diagnosis of exactly where we are. He did that with the church of Ephesus. And he said that of all of their good doctrine, the one thing that they were missing was what? Their true and genuine love for God. A sense of holy joy in the Lord. They had lost or left their first love. Psalm 51, David cries out, for the Lord's forgiveness. And he says, restore to me the, what? Joy of my salvation. That was what he missed. 
In Ezra 6, 22, the Lord made them joyful when they rebuilt the temple, when they reinstated the Passover and God was worshipped again in the land. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, as they returned from this exile, which was a result of God's wrath on their lives, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's a renewed sense of true and genuine joy in the Lord that the world can't give, they can't manufacture, and they can't take away. Number six, a sixth evidence of true and genuine revival is the reestablishment of family religion. I think this is one of the greatest marks that's missing when revivals are discussed. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones is, in my estimation, outside of Spurgeon, the greatest preacher who ever lived apart from the Apostle Paul and obviously the Lord Jesus and all of those prophets of Scripture. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a medical doctor, very high ranking in his day, and he gave it up to be a gospel preacher. He was an expositor. He preached verse by verse through God's Word. And he was also an expert in all of the great revivals of history. And he said that the number one evidence of great revivals throughout history is that you see a revival of family religion. You see a desire for men and women to see that their home is ordered around God's Word. Family worship is established. A family altar is conducted in There's time spent reading and singing and praying God's Word. And then not only time set aside, but as you go. Again, looking back to George Whitfield, George Whitfield had a good friend that was very, very, very well known. Does anyone know who it was? Benjamin Franklin. Anyone heard of Benjamin Franklin? Benjamin Franklin was obviously an extremely well-known inventor, statesman, and all sorts of other areas. Whitfield wrote to Franklin. He preached to Franklin. He tried everything that he could to give this man the gospel. Franklin was so compelled by Whitfield's preaching, but as far as we know, he never surrendered to Christ. But he said, if I ever would, it would be at the hands of George Whitfield. George Whitfield uh, once asked, or someone asked Franklin, if you don't even believe what the man's preaching, why in the world do you keep going to hear him preach? And he said, because I know that he believes what he's preaching. He wanted to hear somebody set on fire preaching something that the people were convinced that the man believed what he was preaching. Well, Benjamin Franklin, to our knowledge, was unconverted to the end of his life. But he began to look at the fruit of revival. And it took off. On another occasion, Benjamin Franklin was preparing to go hear Whitfield preach. This is all free. Like, I'm just so excited about this stuff, by the way. And Franklin knew that if he ended up in the same area with George Whitfield, that he would be so compelled at the end when Whitfield would call for an offering to give to the orphanages in Georgia. Whitfield, uh, Franklin knew that he'd end up giving in the offering. He knew that he wouldn't be able to contain himself. So Benjamin Franklin took his wallet out of his pocket and he left it at home and he said, there's no way I'm giving in tonight. He went to the revival meeting. He heard George Whitfield preach. He fell under such conviction. Whitfield asked for an offering for the poor children in Georgia. And uh, Franklin reached for his billfold, didn't have it. And he asked a very well-known friend who was beside him to borrow some money so that he could give him the offering. (laughs) You talk about falling under conviction. You say, what was he preaching? That Jesus Christ lived a perfectly righteous life and He died the death that sinners deserve. He rose from the dead and everyone who repents of their sins and believes in Christ will be saved. Do you want to be saved tonight? That's what He's preaching. (laughs) And people fell under conviction. Well, Benjamin Franklin described the fruit of the revival as an outsider, a secular observer. Quote, It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion. He said it seemed as if the whole world were growing religious. So that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. 
May it be so again. He said, we know that something's happening here because every family is rejoicing in the Lord. They're singing, they're reading God's word and trying to live according to it. 2 Kings 17 verse 41 brings us into a revival and we read, So these nations feared the Lord and also served their carved images. Their children did likewise, and their children's children, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. We see a similar picture in Joshua chapter 1, which says that from generation to generation, the gospel was handed down to children, to grandchildren, to great-grandchildren, trained in the ways of the Lord, until in Joshua chapter 1, it said that a generation arose who neither knew the Lord nor his works for Israel. Friends, do we not live in that day to day? Not so much that people have rejected the Bible, although they certainly have, just a complete ignorance of it altogether and a call to family religion. In his great duty, in his sermon entitled, The Great Duty of Family Religion, George Whitfield pleaded. And he said this, he said, it would surely be enough one day that you would have to give an account for your own sins. But how much more will you endure the account that you must give among those that you have not shared Christ against who will testify against you? Oh, how we need to recover family religion. Number seven, a seventh evidence is the redemption of the church. When revival breaks out on the pages of the New Testament, you see that the local church is ground zero. It's happening in and through local churches. Where was Jonathan Edwards when he preached his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? And people gripped the pew because they literally thought that they might fall into hell at any moment. He was in a local church. And what we see in the 1700s and the 1800s it's not just unconverted church members, but it had become a widespread pr practice to have unconverted clergy. Do you know what that means? The pastors aren't even saved. And it got so bad that a lot of churches were making the case that if he was at least moral and knew anything about the Bible, he didn't even have to be saved to pastor a church. This is unbelievable. Even the forerunner to jo Jonathan Edwards, Solomon Stoddard, famous, wonderful preacher was making the argument that you didn't have to be a Christian to join a church and observe the Lord's Supper. And so when revival then takes out, the church is redeemed and called to repentance and people are awakened and people who thought they were saved but aren't are saved. And those who have fallen asleep in their salvation, God restores to new life. Finally, number eight, and we'll end the last evidence of true and genuine revival is a reformation in the world. Reformation in the world. Well, that's the name of our church, and that's the name of what we need to see in our day-to-day -day more than ever. Finally, in closing, one historian described the impact of the Great Awakening on the world and the culture around it in this way. Again, this has come straight from Dalimore and George Whitfield. You need to get that book. He said, a religious revival, burst forth, which changed in a few years the whole temper of English society. The church was restored to its life and activity. Religion carried to the hearts of the people a fresh spirit of moral zeal. It purified our literature and our manners. A new philanthropy reformed our prisons, infused clemency and wisdom into our penal laws, abolished the slave trade, and gave the first impulse to popular education. Friends, let me ask you a question. Where did the advent of the modern hospital come from? Where did the advent of education come from? Where did the advent of orphanages and everything else that we know that is a good to common society come from? Christianity. It was Christians who were revived during times of awakening who went out and started these organizations because they knew that the gospel reconciled men to God and the implications of that is to bear forth fruit in our world 
in loving our neighbor. And so there's a reformation where the culture begins to see the ripple effects of what God's doing in the church. I think that we ought to pray for these things. Let's look back at them one last time. A recovery of Scripture and the Gospel. A restoration of prayer. Repentance from sin. A return to holiness. A renewal of joy. Reestablishment of family religion. The redemption of the church to a central place in the life of the Christian. And then working for reformation in the world. You say, Brandon, where are you intending to lead us? What is our direction as a church? Honest to goodness, from day one, these eight marks have been it and they'll continue to be it. This is the vein that we're in and we need to pray that God does what only God can do. And in the meantime, we do what God's told us to do. We preach the Bible. We enjoy fellowship with one another. We pray together and we observe baptism and the Lord's Supper and we ask the Lord and plead with Him to do a great work. Do you want to see that? Let's pray. Father, we pray, God, we pray that you would call your people back to your word. God, help us to hunger and thirst for your word. Help us to desire to hear your voice through your word. Lord, as it's been said, if we want to hear your voice audibly, all we need to do is read the Bible out loud. Help us to love the Bible. Help us to return to the gospel. God, we pray that you would help our hearts to be inclined to you in prayer. We confess so often our prayerless lives because we think that we got it on our own. And Father, we pray that you would help us to love pleading with you and enjoying all of life in awareness of your presence. Father, we pray for a sense of repentance from sin. That we wouldn't be comfortable with sin, but we would constantly be running from it. Father, we pray for a return to holiness, that we would love your law and your standards, and that you would help us to live according to it. God, that you would show us mercy in our failures and help us to continue to strive as we fall and fail to love your word. Father, we pray for a renewal in our church of holy joy, that there would be a sense of joy in God like nothing this world can offer. Lord, we pray for a reestablishment of family religion. We pray that you would help fathers to lead their homes and mothers in the roles that you've given them and children to honor and obey their parents. And we pray that you would save our children. God, would you save our grandchildren? Would you arm them with a biblical worldview and stake them in truth? Guard their hearts and lives. And we pray that you would help us to see that our homes revolve around your word. And then we pray you do what only you can do. Father, we pray for the redemption of the church. God, we pray the church would be ground zero for a great work of God yet still to be seen. We pray that we love the local church and not see one another as obstacles to walking in holiness, but rather bridges and helps in our lives. And Father, we pray for reformation in the world that we have. They cause good, evil, and evil good. We pray, Lord, for reform, for reformation. And we pray that it would happen through the church, which is being sought in light in the public square. And we pray all of these things based on not our goodness, but your mercy, knowing that you are able and willing, and we just want to be faithful, and we need you to help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.